Good evening. I'm Paul Martineau, curator of photographs at the Jade Paul Getty Museum and venue curator of the exhibition Tim Walker, Wonderful Things. The exhibition was organized by our colleagues at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London and the Getty Center is the last, and the last stop and the only US venue on a five city international tour. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this conversation, which will explore the fantastical visions of Walker, a brilliant creative artist who uses photography as his primary medium. It is also my great pleasure to introduce, introduce our esteemed panelists. Susanna Brown is a specialist in the intertwined histories of photography and fashion and the author of eight books, She's held curatorial roles at Britain's National Portrait Gallery and the Victoria and Albert Museum. The acclaimed v &A exhibitions Brown has curated have been displayed at more than 20 venues globally and include Selling Dreams, 100 Years of Fashion Photography, Horst, Photographer of Style, and most recently, Tim Walker, Wonderful Things. Our second guest is Sarah Moonvis, who is the editor-in-chief editor of W Magazine. She's the first female editor of W and the youngest editor-in-chief of a major American fashion magazine. Under Moonvis, W Magazine became an independently owned company called W Media, of which she is president. She has spent 15 years in fashion publishing. She was previously fashion editor at Vogue and T, the New York Times style magazine. Moonviz and Walker have worked with such celebrities as Lady Gaga and Frank Ocean and transformed Tilda Swinton into the poet Edith Sitwell for W. Tim Walker rose to prominence in the 90s with his highly imaginative and fantastical photographs inspired by his love of fairy tales and a thirst for adventure. Since then, his exuberant fashion pictures and striking portraits have graced the pages of magazines such as Vogue, Vanity Fair, W, Love, Another Man, and ID. He's published seven books and has staged exhibitions at major museums. His short films and projects with musicians have won him international acclaim. Please join me in welcoming them with a round of applause. Thank you so much, Paul, and thank you all of you for being here. It's, it's a full house, which is really exciting, and I know we've also got lots of friends online joining us virtually, so welcome to our virtual guests as well. Uh, and we have a really nice hour or so ahead to chat about the two of you, your incredible collaborations over the years, the exhibition here open today at the Getty, and then hopefully at the end, uh, if we don't chat for too long. Uh, you guys can ask us uh, some questions as well. Um, so let's, let's kick off, let's kick off. We've got a lot to cover. Um, for those of you who don't know <coughs> Tim's work, um, we just have a little tiny little biography here. Um, and we were, we were chatting together earlier about America and obviously you guys work so closely together for, for 15 years both in London and here in the US. Um, but your, your career really began here in the States, in a way, didn't it? With, Be, in being in an a photo assistant. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I was um, mopping the floors of New York studios <laughs> and emptying bins and um, just general stuff like that, yeah. Yeah. But that was, um, God, I can't remember what year that was, ages ago. Yeah, yeah. Atherton. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. you have, I remember in the past telling, hearing some interesting stories you told about your time with him and learning from him in terms of how to work with the models as kind of performers and the... Well, yeah, I mean, I think um, Avedon uh, was a, a great communicator mm. and he really um, 
loved performance and he, he so enjoyed it and he was a brilliant director and encouraging people to perform mm -hmm. um, and I think it's funny looking at his name on the, on the, on this list here I just think um, my overriding memory of working with Avedon was learning how to talk to people mm. and encourage them to make a performance and that I'm indebted to him for sure yeah he was the one and that's something we're going to talk about a bit more with Sarah later, that idea of kind of performing for the camera and kind of conjuring up a performance, often in the projects that you work on in a very short space of time. But let's go back in time and think about kind of the first uh, projects that you guys collaborated with, because you've been friends and, and colleagues for so long now. So it's way back, f 15 or so years ago, Sarah, Tell us a bit more about your, your early work together. Um, I met Tim when I was an assistant at Vogue. Um, I'd been a huge fan of his work uh, long before then, so... You never told me that. <laughs> <laughs> here at first here. Um, and um, we... Uh, Kim has an incredible agent, Camille Lowther, who is my agent as well. So when I got to W as a fashion editor, uh, I had Camilla convinced him to work with me, and uh, it really changed the course of my career uh, in many ways. Uh, working with Tim made me push myself in ways that I hadn't before. I think when um, you look at Tim's work, and as a fashion editor, you want to make sure you are able to add to his vision, and mm -hmm. um, so it's been an amazing collaborative uh, relationship uh, that just keeps getting better and better. Mm. I feel very lucky. Yeah, and that idea of collaboration is very much at the heart of the exhibition here at the Getty. That I remember when Tim and I um, first started talking about this project, uh, when I worked at the V&A, it was probably 2015, I think, you came to see me and we ha had a cup of tea uh, and Tim said, oh, you know, I'd love to do an exhibition at the V&A and I'd really love my collaborators to be a part of that project and to really be seen and appreciated. And, and right from the start, you, you wanted to kind of highlight well, think, the importance yeah. of your collaborators. I think that um, photo with photography, people see the name of the photographer, mm. but they, everyone forgets how just the conversations you have with friends, editors, writers, makeup artists, hairdressers, mm. agents. There's such a, it's, it's a myriad of people that, that in, in a way, it's like we took that photograph as opposed to I took that photograph. I always mm. think that. Um, yeah. yeah, it's like a, a myriad of people that yeah. make a photograph. And I think for you, it's, it's almost become a family, hasn't it? That there are so many people that you um, work with time and again, and we'll, we'll come on to that um, in a moment, that idea of, of kind of building relationships with collaborators. But also just to say, mm. I think that something I noticed at the V&A and then again last night and sent pictures to everyone, all the assistants are always credited in Tim's pictures, which is a real rarity in mm -hmm. fashion photography. So last night, walking through the exhibit, getting to take pictures of my assistants' names and text them and say, look, it's your name in the Getty Museum, um, it really speaks to Tim's character. Yes, and I think often for, for people who, who already know your work, they might not realize just what a, a vast um, team it, it can take sometimes. And I think, yeah, I think photography, the way <coughs> we look at photographs, I mean, historically, photographers would make a picture and it would just be the photographer mm -hmm. and the subject. That's yeah. how we understand photography. That was the birth of photography. You'd rock up <coughs> and shoot with daylight. And then once you start to elaborate and broaden the possibility of a photograph, you can very quickly end up with a team of 80 yeah. plus people, yeah. you know, and it's, it's inconceivable because then that, of course, when you look at these pictures of these uh, famous um, actors, you don't see all the people behind that. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah. And that's something that I'm really fascinated by and I'm sure everyone's re really interested to hear more about this evening. Um, when you're working with performers rather than fashion models, when you're working mm. with actors and performers, um, 
they're actually not used to static posing for the camera in the way a, a fashion model would be. So actually photographing stars like this, I imagine presents quite a different challenge than if you guys are collaborating on a, on a fashion shoot with Kate Moss, for example, um, who's very used to holding a pose. It's, it's a completely different process, really, I photographing think films. I've, I've worked with a lot of actors who are freaked out at the idea of being static. Yeah. <coughs> because they're used to, to walking across a stage or <coughs> in front of a moving camera, and then when you're saying, well, can you do that again? Or <coughs> It's very problematic. Mm. Um, and uncomfortable, and they feel very frozen in time. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and I think that um, that's very interesting. And then uh, I always think of photographic models, subjects, they're like silent movie actresses or actors. Mm -hmm. They're very, um, it's a silent thing and it's a frozen mm -hmm. thing that mm -hmm. is, a, is another gestural articulation mm -hmm. that I think is. Um, Yes, yeah, it's, it's interesting, don't you think? Definitely. And I think that, you know, we were talking about, you know, working with celebrities earlier, and it's such a short amount of time. You know, usually, you know, all the actors here, they're prepping for a year for a movie, and they're, you know, learning about their character, and, you know, spending so much time getting into a role, whereas with us, they come on set, and we want them to sort of play this character in front of the camera, but it's in, you know, a few hours' time. Yeah. So it's a lot of you know, pressure, but it's also exciting, I think, in a really different way. Mm. And often, I'm assuming you, you only have, a f as you said, a few hours or maybe even less with some of these superstars. Yeah. They're, they're busy people. You don't have two days for the shoot, right? Definitely. I mean, it's a really, you know, obviously the more time they give us, it's usually a better picture, but especially on things like, you know, the covers that you just saw on the last page, you know, we did that all in three days. So you really only have set amounts of time with people. But, you know, I look at these covers that Tim and I did together and they're really only a few hours for us to meet the person we're shooting, you know, get all the clothes and the hair and makeup right until they're in front of the camera and then that's even mm. more limited time. It's yeah. quick. I mean, I think that something I've learned is you, it seems inconceivable to everyone in here, but really to make a really meaningful photograph of someone, you need three days, mm -hmm. which is a long time yes. yeah. to ask to be with someone and stare at them and observe yeah. them. It, mm -hmm. But I've noticed that it's like the first day is you're kind of sketching and doodling, and mm -hmm. then the second day you kind of might get a way in to the world and then by the third day that's when the best pictures happen mm. but um you know people don't have that time no. and then you have to work on devices to make pictures work very quickly mm. and almost i imagine building a, a rapport a relationship a friendship with someone yeah i think you, in you very get quick you get very close to people very quickly mm. it's a very um I was just actually making a, a portrait of a photographer this morning and I was photographing him and, and I was very close to him when I was taking the picture yeah. and he was, I'd never met him before and I I'm really admire his photography and then he was freaked out that I was so close to him Oh wow! and he said oh, when I take pictures I'm like <laughs> way over the other side of the room, you're really invading my space, oh, pull God. back <laughs> yeah. and I was like oh, well you know and then it's like you learn, you have to very quickly learn and it's like reading people's energies and mm. Mm. understanding what they're saying, even when they're not saying something, because no photograph is going to be good if someone's uncomfortable. Yes. So it's about being really attuned to their mood. You have to, to be so mood. kind of um, attuned, and which is, I think, why I do it, because I'm fascinated by people, and I love looking at people. I love, it, you know, like my mum used to take me and my brother to um, a cafe in, in where we grew up and we used to look out on a window, we used to get a table and we used to look at all the people walking mm -hmm. on the street and as a child, my brother and I used to sit there and we were mesmerised by all the people. I think we stared at people and it's that, I've, yeah, I think I'm so, I've got more than three days of patience to stare at people. Yeah. I've got three months, <laughs> yeah. three years, however long it yeah. takes, but it's however long 
the person will give me. Yeah. And I think having having known you a long time and sort of watched you photograph people as well, and watched you just interact with with people you know and people you don't know. What I find really interesting is you treat everyone equally, mm. and that that I, I think so. is important. Um, so. Sarah's nodding. Yeah. Do you think? I mean, I think we often will shoot a portfolio where you have the biggest celebrities in the world and then an actress that's done a small part in one movie and Tim treats them exactly the same. And I think that that's what makes the picture special and it doesn't give weight to someone more famous and it does feel like a portfolio of amazing people rather than focus on the very famous ones. I think that's really important, especially you know, for my end of things at W, I want to give them all mm. equal importance. So I think it's really special mm. that that's how you work, and that we work. And everyone is given that that care yeah. and attention. I remember actually when, when the exhibition was on, feels like a thousand years ago now, but it's 2019 when it opened uh, over in London at the v and And I remember there was lots of different friends and, and family that you brought to the exhibition. And one day you said, oh, in the morning, uh, I'm bringing my mum's uh, neighbour, she's a hundred, oh, yeah. um, and she's bringing some friends, they're all about a hundred. Um, <laughs> and she, then she genuinely is a hundred. She is a hundred, yeah. I remember, well, now she yeah. must be a hundred and three. Yeah, she still is, she is. And she was fabulous, and you said, and then we'll have a quick sandwich in the staff cafe, and then Harry Styles is coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it was the, the way that you treated those individuals was exactly the same, the way you interacted with them. And I think that's what you bring to your shoots, that, that mm. sense of care and attention to, to everyone in a very equal way. And then, as you said, a, a fascination for everyone, no matter who they are, no matter what their story, you're very interested in individuals, I think. Yeah, I think that um, everyone has got something special. I really do. I wholeheartedly know, actually, that everyone has something special. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the responsibility of the photographer to see what that special thing is mm -hmm. and make a picture about that. So, yeah. And often your pictures um, are sort of deceptively simple. I think some people know your your work with huge sets and very kind mm. of elaborate props. And, you know, you, you guys work for months planning those shoots. But sometimes, like these images, they're very um, spare, I guess. Is, I think that's um, a reaction to the, uh, the complication. In fact, now I, I actually find it very difficult to take a picture in a complicated place. Mm. Um, even going outside gets complicated. Um, so, and, and then now I know that it's... it's I think that there was... Um, perhaps a shyness I had as a young photographer to confront the person. Um, and this, for example, that picture of Willem Dafoe, I was always so, I, I took that picture very recently actually with Sarah, and I was so um, in love with Willem Dafoe. I mean, I was always so into him as a kid and I just thought he was so handsome, so he was a brilliant actor and da da da. Mm -hmm. And then when I, we, Sarah was, said, oh, we're going to be doing Willem Dafoe. I was like, oh my God, I'm, you know, I, I was so... Previously, I would have decorated a room with balloons and flowers and cows just because <laughs> I was so scared of him. Cows. And then at 2018, I realised I had to confront yeah. my, you know, really confront Willem Dafoe head on. And, and he, uh, it was terrifying. I was absolutely... You, it's very scary yeah. being a photographer. Yeah. Uh, we get scared. Yeah. Do you? you? Know? Well, you yeah. have all these plans. I think, you know, mm. we, before this shoot, we'd been talking for months and exchanging ideas and you put so much together and then you get there and there's a lot of it that's left to chance because if Willem Dafoe got there and said, I don't want to wear this and I don't want the smoke and I don't want, it's like you have to pivot quickly and you have to sort of think fast because there's not a lot of time and you want to make the best image possible. And I think that there's even another level when it's someone you've been a fan of because you really want to do a good job. So it's very, you know, challenging, but I think that's what also makes it fun. And mm -hmm. even the Timothy picture, that's absolutely not what we had thought about or planned at all, but it ended up being, I think, one of our favorites from the whole series. Mm. 
Oh, really? You you had beforehand something very different in mind for Timothy. You know, it's funny because he had just done Call Me By Your Name and become this very, very famous young actor. And, you know, he was adorable, but he definitely wanted to be cool. And so he had a lot of ideas about that and the clothes and whatnot. And, you know, I think this captures his sort of amazing innocence in that moment. But I definitely don't think that that was something we had thought about before. Mm. But you know, this is such a moment in time that I don't know if we brought him to set today, it would be the same experience. Yes, yeah, five years on, he's probably quite a different person. Exactly. Actually. Yeah. Well, I hope he is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you, as we, we touched on, you know, you plan for so long, and I know often on these kind of shoots, the wardrobe is, is vast, right? The, the, the kind of range of clothes that you're pulling together for a big kind of Hollywood shoot like this is huge, but what happens if people don't want to wear the clothes? Like, what happens if people show up and they're like, I, I don't like it, or it's not me? What do you do? Oh, it's a disaster. But no, you, fi you figure it out. I mean, for, for best performances, which is what these are from, um, we have so many options. Like, we really sort of plan for everything. So we have things that are so wild and amazing and one of a kind and special, and then we have white T-shirts and black pants and things like that. And I think that for me... I sort of learned early, like, don't force it. They're not, if they don't want to wear something, they don't want to wear something. And if you put it on them and make them do it, they're not going to be happy when they're in front of the camera. The moments when they say, oh my gosh, I do want to wear that incredible thing that was flown from Paris is an amazing moment. Mm -hmm. But if they don't, you kind of react to it and you pivot in a really nice way. You know, I think that you really have to listen and you have to be mm. really kind of calm with them because it's intimidating. Mm. And a few times celebrities will say things like, you know, this isn't a movie, I'm playing me. So they want to mm. wear their own style. And I think you have to kind of convince them you're also a character here. You know, we're not just shooting you as you off the street. There's something mm. more fantastical about it. And, you know, most of the time they get into it, but, mm. you know, Sometimes they don't. You know, there was an actor that came on the set that looked through the clothes and walked off, and that was it. And you just sort of laugh and move on, wow. and that's it. There's nothing else you can do. And <laughs> he, you just know, he, he just, just left. left. Wow. He just left. He just left. And oh. it was we were going through the rack, and he said, "I think I'm gonna go." And I went over to Tim and said, "He's he's left." I was left. quite happy. <laughs> I was relieved. I was genuinely relieved. A <laughs> few. One less person yeah. to photograph today. Wow. And it's funny because people go, oh, are you so mad? Are you angry? You never know. Someone's having a bad day or they didn't, you know, I try not to think they got onto our set and said, this looks horrible. Yes. I don't want to be a part yeah. of any of it. So you kind of just have to laugh it off and not take it yeah. personally. <laughs> yeah. And it goes back to what you're saying about being able to read people and mm. know, you know, maybe they've had a difficult morning or maybe they're in a great mood they've just had amazing news and being sort of intuitive and sensitive to that is important isn't yeah, it and just for sure you know making a, an environment where people can be playful i mean mm. i i don't really know what the the best place people could be in to have their picture taken i mean it, mm. it must be inti intimidating it must you're walking into a a studio, you don't know what's going to be there, and you know. I mean, I think we're all really. F you're very friendly with people when they walk in. She's very good. good. I tend to be good. shy and more reserved, that's but right. Sarah's very good at welcoming and come join the. P I mean, I think that's the other thing. When you're making photographs, the rule is you're actually hosting a party, mm. and she's a very good. <laughs> party okay. host what a great way of thinking about I it. think it is I really yeah. think it's a party it has yes. to be really yeah well I love a party so she loves a party. <laughs> you're in your element so you want people to have a good time you want well, them to enjoy that process yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. It shouldn't else be what would be awful if it was painful yes yeah oh, you yeah. always want someone to leave a shoot and feel like it was fun it was great I want to work with them again you know the worst feeling would be someone leaving saying I hope I never see the those two again you know which I'm sure happens. has happened <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah but you know what's interesting people. about best performances though is that we don't and this is something special that that Tim does we don't hide what we've done already so you know Saoirse Ronan's picture is being shown to Margot Robbie and I actually think that 
that's such a nice thing because I think, one, it adds this kind of sense of competition because they are actors. Like, oh, that picture looks really good. I want to beat that. And it kind of also makes them feel like, oh, I shouldn't be the one saying, I just want to wear a T-shirt and stand there and do nothing because then they sort of know other people mm -hmm. have done it. It builds these kind of shoots. You know, sometimes the first picture is amazing and it's one of our favorites, but I think usually it kind of builds and we don't want them, you know, everyone to be day one and us, you know, not be able to build on our story. The momentum kind of gathers over yeah. time. You just mentioned Margot Robbie. Wasn't it Margot Robbie who was very kind of playful and fun? And I forget the story now, but wasn't there a story about Margot? Oh, it just that we, when <coughs> we, we, she came onto the set, um, I don't know why we came up with this, but we wanted to paint her pink. <gasps> and yes. This was years before Barbie casting. <laughs> we know nothing about that. Yeah. But yeah. she um, she was really down for it, and yeah. she was really into it. We didn't use the picture in the end. We used the picture when she wasn't pink, but <laughs> she got painted pink, and she looked great. Yeah, she I did. bet. I wish I could show you the picture. You don't have that <laughs> picture, guys, but you can mm. kind of use your imagination you can, yeah, for that yeah. one, I think. Yeah. I do think that the Barbie people had that reference somewhere so because it was too coincidental. Yeah, that's a point of inspiration, for sure. Um, and you talked about that idea of people wanting to return. You know, people have a portrait taken or work, work with you and then you want them to f feel positive and leave that experience thinking, when can I come back? When can I have my photograph taken again? And I think um, Tilda Swinton is a great um, example. I'll come back to these paintings in a moment. Um, Tilda Swinton is a great example of that, someone who you, you first photographed for W, and this, this is a shoot way back in 2012 in Mexico, and that relationship has kind of continued through the years, and, and your collaboration gets sort of bolder and bigger year on year, doesn't it? I think as <coughs> you, when you work with someone, it's going back to that three-day thing, you end up realizing that there is a, a lifetime of, of picture making, because someone is, there is a relationship between all of the group. Mm -hmm. And I think with Tilda, yeah, you could just go on and on. But um, yeah, that was, um, that's a, a great relationship mm -hmm. to have with someone where you can keep going back. It's such a, a gift for a photographer to, to make a relationship with a subject and just keep photographing them. Yes. And yeah. you know, it just is when it's, when it feels like it's, endless possibilities, that's, um, that's such a, an exciting thing. And I think this shoot, I'll just show a couple more of those pictures. I mean, they're all extraordinary and there's so many of them, but this shoot, I guess for me as a curator, sort of made me realize for the first time how very closely your photography is aligned with painting that, and fine art in, in all its forms, that so often um, the starting point or the spark uh, of inspiration for what you're doing comes from um, historical works of art, in, mm. in this case, um, two female artists in particular. And you know that, that premise of, of starting with um, artworks and sort of treasures from the history of art um, is, is the premise that, that underpins our whole exhibition that, that you guys are seeing here at the moment. Um, but can we talk a little bit more about this shoot with Tilda and the particular um, references for the project? Uh, I think, in fact, I think um, it was really working with Tilda and um, Jerry, who is Tilda's creative director. Jerry researches, bef before we work together, he'll look at ideas and bring things to the table. And in fact, I think that was the first time I really was looking at a multitude of references. The first time I worked with Tilda, we were referencing The Wizard of Oz, David Bowie, or, or, so many different things and that whole, possibility to raid so many different ingredients from the history of art, contemporary to ancient. And this particular shoot, we were looking at Leonora Carrington and Remedius Varro. And if you look at all the little characters in the Carrington painting, you can really see <laughs> where we pilfered all the hairstyles and, the, and, and that 
Yeah, I mean, that was actually that going back to the caterpillar one. I don't know whether you can all see, but the, the, on Tilda's eyebrows, they're, they're actually caterpillars that were crawling around the jungle. And we picked them up and we were positioning them <laughs> and they were wriggling. And then that's a, a, a beetle on the orchid that she's holding. And, and the eyebrows were moving as the caterpillar. It would actually be better as a moving I photograph. Shame it isn't moving, actually, but feel. they were moving, those caterpillars. <laughs> So um, you're, you're mixing painting and Leonora Carrington and surrealism and, and the, the idea of the surreal yeah. being a caterpillar on a leaf and then you just end up putting it on the eyebrow and then that, yeah. all those serendipitous elements. And even a decade, sorry, sorry, I was yeah, just yeah. going to say, even a decade later, I feel like shoots like this really... Um, stick in your mind. And I remember Tilda saying very recently, oh, those, those caterpillars smelt like marzipan. And yeah. like her memory of this <laughs> moment they was did. very vivid. Yeah, they smelt <laughs> like a... <coughs> they really did, like a marzipan. They, I, was, I don't know what it was, the pee of the caterpillar, because they were scared. <laughs> I don't know. But it was fragrant, smelt good. Fragrant caterpillars. Mm. And we'll talk more um, about your work with Tilda in, in a moment, but I wanted to, to move on now to, to kind of go back in time to 2015, 16. As I say, that was the moment we, we started chatting about the possibilities of the V&A Museum as a, a place for an exhibition and, and the possibilities of using the collection as a, a starting point for new photographic shoots, which is what all of you see in the exhibition here. Um, and I love these pictures of you. This was in 2017, but you, you spent about a year or a little over a year, mm. um, I guess, mining the collection, exploring every uh, nook and cranny of the museum. And, and uh, for those of you who haven't visited the v &A in London, um, there are seven miles mm. of galleries and corridor spaces throughout the building. It is truly vast, and I think you covered every inch uh, of the museum yeah. in that time. There was a lot, I do tend to get obsessed. <laughs> and yeah, really, uh, yeah. Anyways, that took yeah. a long time. I mean, but we it was climbed across the roof, we sort of hiked mm. over the roof. Mm. There's beehives uh, on top of the museum. We, we visited the beehives, we went into the air conditioning kind of ducts under the Victorian building, which is very Alice in Wonderland. You remember those mm, little yeah. corridors it's and tiny doors? Scary. It was quite a claustrophobic experience. Um, but I think these three portraits of you kind of sum up that, that year or so very well, that, that sense of real exploration. And you were very interested in seeing the things that weren't on display as well. You're very interested in um, meeting the staff that care for the collections, the um, curatorial staff and their assistants, the conservation staff, the framing specialists and so on. Um, and you met dozens and dozens of people throughout that time. And, and in, uh, I apologize for the quality of my phone snaps, but this is you kind of exploring behind the scenes here, isn't it? And these, some of these pictures are actually taken at the Museum of Childhood as well, which was a really interesting day when we looked at um, sort of 17th and 18th century children's clothing. And um, I don't know how well all of you can see it on, on the slide here, but we got into quite a long conversation about fashion and danger and that idea that um, historically a lot of the dyes and fabrics used potentially were quite, <coughs> excuse me, quite dangerous. Remember, we had a long conversation about toxic um, dye that was historically used. And then we got talking about crinolines and um, the fact that crinolines, because oxygen gathers beneath the hoops of a crinoline and it's very flammable. And then just as we were talking about that, you started drawing a photo shoot. That's a sketch of an idea you had about crinolines and catching on fire, and if you guys can't read it, um, it says crinolines on fire in a church, which is a, a, a true story. Um, what's the story behind it? Ask Susanna, that's me. Why? Killed by fashion. Um, poison laced into Elizabethan dress. And there were all these ideas kind of rushing out from your imagination as I we do, were looking I, at this. I do think that fashion is quite agonising. Yeah. Like, if you look at do you not? I mean, yeah, it is. I agree. It's quite 
painful, yeah. you know, and uh, always for women and increasingly for men, I think that it's this strange sort of torture we put ourselves through. Yeah, I mean, watching a woman walk down a, or a man walk down a runway at a fashion show isn't exactly looking at them being comfortable in any way, and that's no. where we grab all the clothes from. So strange. But, but I think that both of us gravitate towards the things that aren't so comfortable, <laughs> whatever mm. that means about us, but it's always like even this picture here, you know, and then we did what you'll see, this um, photo that's in the show of these Valentino dresses, but they're made by Montclair puffer jackets that we had models standing on huge ladders that were sweating, and it was this sort of very dramatic uh, moment, but it was worth it. <laughs> and oh, you always end up with the wrong clothes for the wrong time of year. Oh. So I, I know that if I end up wanting to photograph someone in puffer coats, it's going to be a very, very hot day. Yep. And then when you're doing you know, n no clothes, it's going to be very cold. It's just a rule of thumb. I now know that. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Because a lot of the shoots for the exhibition took place in a, a wildly hot English summer. Yeah, that was, yeah that was serendipitous mm -hmm. and useful mm -hmm. for the light. Um, yeah, but that's something that you, you uh, as someone that goes in regard, you look at a photograph, you don't know that the f all the the f choices the photographer didn't have. You have to just work with the weather. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, blazing sun is very difficult to work with. And sometimes, I c I've actually, I really don't know what's good anymore. I've lost the plot. And <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't tell. I've lost it now. I just and go with it. In the exhibition, you're the range of shoots that you, you did for the project, I mean, we'll skip back, sorry, because I've skipped ahead to that lovely shoot that Sarah mentioned. Um, the range of objects was incredibly broad. After you did your many months of research at the museum, you, you kind of gathered this collection that really, I think, represents the eclecticism uh, of the v and holdings and the range and, and global and historical range of the museum's collections. Um, but also the shoots that you then made, which there were 10 uh, photo shoots in total, um, some were, as you say, outdoors on bright sunny days, some were in your own studio in East London, some were in um, sort of cavernous warehouse type studios. And I, I wanted to talk a little bit more about a couple of the shoots in detail, um, in particular those that you, you both worked on together, uh, the first of which is this, um, called Illuminations. Um, and we had a lovely day at the museum with Terry, who's the curator of stained glass mm. collections, didn't we? And I, I remember you saying how drawn you were to the colours in these medieval and renaissance panels of glass. Yeah, I think that the, the stained glass there with the couple in bed who look like they're dead, but they're not. They're actually, that's on their wedding night. <laughs> um, and they've got a little dog that... Um, represents faith, I think. Did it? Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it's the colour. I think colour is an emotional response. Um, and I think it was that red in the, the, the curtains hanging up, you assume is a four-poster bed or the, you know, I've always had an um, emotional response to red mm. for, for numerous reasons. But, um, and then you want to try and emulate that emotional colour thing. And yeah. it's the colour of the photographer's darkroom, I guess, mm. red. Maybe that's part of why it resonates so much with you. Have you heard of Arab? Mm -mm. It means always red in a picture. Oh, yeah. Red lips, red shoes, red gloves. There should always be there a, always a should be red. Oh, and it's a thing, cinematographers, like if you've seen Schindler's List, yeah. There's that famous sequence of the little girl mm -hmm. and the film is black and white mm -hmm. and then she's got this little red coat on. Yes. That's a yes. classic oh, no. Arab yeah. kind yeah. of... Uh, in fact, that was an homage to that concept. But red, for some reason, is um, red nails, mm. red lips, red shoes, the ruby red slippers. It's a thing. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to look for again you at, at your pictures red. and find yeah, the it's red... A thing. I've got yeah. red sh heels on my shoes. Yeah, you have. <laughs> we yeah. Let's look in, in more detail at this shoot because it, it was one of the first um, that you did for the exhibition. And 
in some ways it was one of the more um, literal shoots in that you took uh, a stained glass panel from the collection and projected, projected that image onto one of the models. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas in all the other shoots that you did, I, I don't think we ever see the, the real object, the, the item from the V&A. Um, but this was very much about that idea of sort of transparent colour and the way that light works sort of projected through colour, mm. like coloured gels as you use. But on just a to explain to the audience, mm. so Sarah styled the shoot, mm. so she was then looking at well, you can. What you, I mean, I remember the beginning of this process, and you started texting me pictures of the stained glass. And sometimes Tim will text me an idea, and we sort of mold the clothes to make sense for the shoot. But this was sort of one of those serendipitous moments that he's sending me these amazing stained glass, and I'm looking at the clothes and thinking, oh my gosh, these clothes work perfectly in this setting. I mean, in this picture with the blue on front of it is a Balenciaga coat. And I kept calling the clothes the end of the world clothes, which worked yeah, kind yeah. of perfectly with what we were doing. And the amazing pictures coming through, me sending Tim pictures, and us getting to sort of capture both the inspiration from the stained glass, but also modern fashion. I mean, none of the clothes that we use in any of our shoots or costumes are historical. They're all modern. And this ran in W, um, and it's clothes that you could have bought in stores, you know, when the issue came out. So it was kind of this amazing thing that you were referencing something so old, and I was looking at something so new, and then we brought them together mm -hmm. and, and did this. and. It was a really special few days in the studio. I mean, the, the picture there, I mean, you would think that we got those hazardous jumpsuits from some, you know, crazy fireman warehouse, but it was actually Calvin Klein, you know, it was very fun. <laughs> <laughs> and this is quite a direct reference to those figures in the bed, actually, as well, isn't it? They're, um, they look a little bit more alive. They're, they're definitely not dead. It's interesting actually seeing the exhibition here at the Getty because at the V&A, this was the very first shoot that, that visitors you, walked yeah. into. Whereas actually when you guys visit the exhibition, you, you see this a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> but in terms of chronology, I think this was one of the first that you shot. And it was, it was closely followed by um, the shoot with Tilda um, in which she sort of conjures the spirit of um, Dame Edith Sitwell, who she... She, am I right in saying she's actually related yeah, to Edith Sitwell, yeah. isn't she? She is. And this Distantly. is a photograph by Beaton. Cecil Beaton, of course. Who's and that's something that you were looking at. I mean, I think Sarah was, again, you were just sort of like, and then Jerry sent us that whole plan yeah. of, he, uh, Jerry, who works with Tilda, he was like, it's all about, it all in the hands, mm. everything. So if you look at the pictures, you can see a lot of hands, because mm. that's how she, articulated herself, Edith Sitwell. She was very much about rings on the hands, and, and that's what we then did. If all the photographs that Beaton took of Edith Sitwell, it's always mm -hmm. very beautiful with the hands, so that's what we were looking at. And then you, were, you bought loads of rings, I Lots remember. Lots of rings. I mean, this was one of the most exciting and fun shoots to prep for, um, just digging into the history of Edith Sitwell, also, you know, Tim letting me into his world with Tilda, you know, they had already built this relationship and I was so excited to get to work with them in this capacity and in this way. And it's sort of a dream project being a fashion editor because you get to dress Tilda, but dress her in this way. And the way we worked on this shoot was we brought, I mean, I think I had hundreds of rings, tons of fabrics to wrap around the head. And we all went to this teeny B&B &B the night before and tried on hundreds of clothes. I mean, I have hundreds of fitting pictures of all of us in this teeny little room with racks and racks of clothes and piles of jewelry. And we really had fun and played dress up and really got into it. It didn't feel like work in any way. Not that most of the time it ever does, but this one in particular felt like we were just having so much fun and it did feel like we were making a movie in a lot mm. of ways. Um, Malcolm Edwards, who is the 
hairstylist on the shoot was wrapping all the different fabrics around her head and figuring out all the shapes. But what happened when we got to the house, the Edith Sitwell house, was you saw her transform and you saw Tilda have no fear of getting rid of her eyebrows and, you know, wearing these sort of extreme headpieces. And we had this magic day. And, you know, sometimes when you're shooting, you don't know what it'll be. You don't know if it'll be special. You don't know if it'll, you know, have an impact on anyone. But I think we all kind of knew that day this is a special shoot. And it was just one day, wasn't it? It's just one day. And by some miracle, the, the English weather was on your side. It was perfect. I remember yeah. sitting in the grass outside having lunch. It was yeah. like this perfect day. And we laughed and we had fun and all the elements came together really perfectly. Mm. Mm. I'd like to show now a very short little film um, because as, as you just said, Sarah, that idea of kind of everyone coming together, the crew, you know, it feels like making a movie sometimes when you're on set. This little film that we're going to look at um, encapsulates that perfectly, the teamwork, the community that kind of comes together. And the film um, is connected to the shoot that's called Soldiers of Tomorrow, um, inspired by this. I remember you said to me, what's the biggest photograph you have in the V&A? That was one thing you were interested in. The, or the biggest object in the whole collection, and what's the smallest object? And we decided this was one of the biggest um, this extraordinary life-size painted photograph uh, from the 1870s of the Bayer Tapestry. And the Bayer Tapestry is a, an object in itself that, of course, isn't in the collection of the V&A, but it's something you love. Um, and embroidery in general is something you're quite interested in, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I love embroidery. embroidery. Mm. Mm. And I love the idea of looking at all the characters in the tapestry and um, envisaging them, which is why it was called Soldiers of Tomorrow, about repurposing clothes and the idea of turning vacuum cleaners into skirts and mm -hmm. re-knitting jumpers into short, whatever the thing was, and, and appropriating second-hand clothes into something new, which mm -hmm. is what the stylist did very well on that. Jack, he did a really great job on that. That's mm -hmm. what the mess, the overriding message was. Yeah, the em environmental possibilities new ways of looking at clothes. Yes. And unusually, actually, it wasn't for a magazine. This this wasn't for W or any no, other magazine. No, this was, was just literally for the, um, the exhibition. For the exhibition. Yeah. Um, and it was shot in your own studio yeah, in my, East London. My, my studio, yeah. And now we can look at this. It's only about 60 seconds, but it really encapsulates that, that day very beautifully, this little film. Um, and that's just, I, I wanted to share with all of you how um, this section of the exhibition was installed when it was originally on in London, um, which is very different to how it's installed here. Um, and we had this sort of, pa almost like a padded cell, this, this padded wall, uh, and the photographs were framed and sort of pressed into the wall, weren't they? It was a very um, kind of tactile space yeah. that, that um, Shona Heath designed to emulate um, the, the set itself, to mm. emulate the set um, from this shoot. So we'll see that little film just now. When you see how small my studio is. <laughs> The music is it's really is stressful. Yeah. It heightens yeah. the mood. Yeah. 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 
And what I love is when you look through the window, you have the kind of morning sunshine and then it's completely mm. pitch dark by the end of the shoot. Oh, it's yeah. a long day. And we've got one other little film here um, because we, we wanted to sort of highlight um, to all of you that we've made lots of different films for this show, um, sort of behind the scenes with, with all of Tim's collaborators. Um, and you can see them on the VNA website, but we, um, we were talking about Malcolm, or Sarah mentioned Malcolm, um, as one of the hairstylists you've worked with for, I'm not even sure how long, it's God. 20 years. Long, long time. I mean, I've worked uh, with you with him for 10, so yeah. probably a long time. Yeah. yeah. And, and we're going to hear from Malcolm uh, and some of your other collaborators in this, in this next little film. Um, and then we're going to move on uh, to talk about the extraordinary new pictures for the Getty uh, and have some time for questions at the end. So this, this is just a two-minute little film um, that's called Working with Tim Walker, uh, Makeup and Hair and you, you really get a beautiful glimpse uh, behind the scenes um, of some of those photographs in the exhibition. Generally my work is quite far out there. It's a bit strange, it's a bit bizarre, but it holds like a certain point of fantasy in it, which I also can see in Tim's work a lot. So I think it's quite a good match, and especially for this shoot, it kind of clicks because it so like strongly Chinese influence and with my, with my father being from Thailand and my grandmother being from China, so I was really inspired by that. Given the imagery of the box, I was really inspired to go into the color schemes of it because it had this really nice pearlescence to it. It had this nice translucency and shine to it. The neon aspect of the shoot or the UV aspect of the shoot threw me a bit at first because I have never or I had never worked with UV makeup and then seeing it on set it really showed me what would be important for this shoot and then seeing the way Tim shoots also showed me the highlight points that would need to be painted in that way. Working with Tim definitely a very warm experience because you keep seeing the same people like you know the people but there's still something new they can show you or something new you have to show them with malcolm it's really fun to just see what what he prepares he keeps bringing like his his big stock on beautiful hair sculptures and you just want to see how these shapes will affect the makeup or how you can enhance the hair, how you can enhance the outfit, all of these things. It's, it's really exciting to be working in a team like that. I guess it is quite sculptural what I do sometimes. I do think of hair as a medium, but in my studio I've got wall to ceiling, you know, shelves of everything. You know, I do spray paint, clay, latex. It's more like a set builder's place, you know, with one chair and one mirror to do hair and the rest of it's like Blue Peter special. I try and get as much information from all the elements, especially set building when we're working with Tim and the origins, the source of, of what the inspirations are. You've got to be as prepped as possible. Sometimes we'll prep for three days in the studio and then we come in and what you've been working on just isn't right. Tim might love them when he looks at them, but in the picture it might jar somewhat. And then there also gets the point of like Tim's lenses and stuff he likes to work with because you create the scene and then he warps it with whatever lens he goes. So you have to pump up the volume of things. That's where the understanding of who you're working with and what you're doing and having that close connection, that sort of comes in. When there's a harmony and there's a synergy between all the elements, then you get a fantastic picture. If one of those elements jars, it doesn't, you know, so that's really key. It's a total collaboration. It really is. And we're going to look next at the Getty pictures, but I've already got loads of questions coming in from our, our uh, guests who are online, our virtual guests. And I would like to ask both of you this question now, having, having just seen that little clip. Um, I'm not sure who the questions come from, but it's a great one. How do you both balance the input from everyone? How do you balance the, um, you know, the clothing and jewellery design, the makeup, the hair, the styling, the set? 
I often think a photographer is a bit like a sort of conductor of an orchestra, trying to get the right balance of sounds and, and keep everyone in time somehow. But this is, this is the crux of the question. How, and it's a quite a difficult question. How do you balance the input? I think I take Sarah's lead a lot of the time because I'm so busy thinking about the picture. Mm -hmm. Sarah will know exactly what, she, right? You know what the hair's <laughs> going to look like. You know what the makeup should be. She'll have so many outfits. And then I just think, okay, Sarah's got hold of all of that bit. And I'm then taking what she's telling me. And then I just kind of like, just, it's all a bit of a ball, um, try and find out the balance in that following Sarah, mm -hmm. I think. Mm. And you really trust uh, I'm her not, instinct. I am a conductor, but I think I'm co-conducting, mm. right? What would you say? I mean, I think that is hard because I think that you want to respect everyone so much. I mean, Malcolm is a genius and he'll have these amazing things on set. And sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes I'll bring these incredible clothes. They don't work. There's just things that you have to roll with the punches. But I think the more time you can plan in advance, the better. If you have a day before to, you know, when we did the stained glass shoot, we had this day before to talk and to actually really get into what it would be and sit with hair, with makeup, with set all together at a lunch table and really go through things. I think that makes it more successful. But I think you just have to listen to everyone and respect everyone, but you also have to sort of at one point be like, okay, we have to get on with it because obviously everyone wants to do certain things. And I think that, you know, as we said before, sometimes there's a celebrity who doesn't want to do any of the things that you guys want to do. But as much planning as possible, as much listening to each other as possible, I think makes for the most successful pictures. Mm -hmm. But the hair and makeup is so important. I'm glad you showed that video because I think that, you know, and Tim taught me this. It was like, I remember doing shoots and certain people wouldn't be available. So we'd have to switch the dates. And often in the beginning of my career, I would think, oh, can't we just use someone else? It doesn't work. It doesn't work whether it's their talent, their personality, the way they think about things. If you don't have the right people, it really just, you have to have all the elements in place or it doesn't work. Yes, it's a, it's a really complicated jigsaw, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah. When we plan best performances, we plan it six months in advance with everyone's schedules because you can't do it otherwise. You have to have that trust. And I think for us, sometimes, like, we'll be on set and they'll, someone else will arrive and we have to just send them to hair and makeup and we'll be, on, you know, on a text chain saying, okay, use this and do that and make it work. And, you know, you just do the best you can and hope everyone feels good about it at the mm. end of the day. Mm. And I know it's something you've both talked about before, that idea of advanced planning. So, as you just said, six months ahead, you're thinking, planning, preparing, scheduling but it's so important to leave space for the unexpected and oh, sort yeah. of serendipity and to leave a little space for these kind of moments of magic, like your caterpillars with Tilda mm. or whatever it might be. I think that's what photography is, really, is that I think if you're making a moving film or you're, you're directing a play, it's so scripted mm. and a movie so storyboarded and so strict and, and time and everything's such a struggle, but... I think one of the great, the greatest aspects of still making a still photograph is the um, ability to react to the unexpected. Mm -hmm. And I think it's great, you know, when we all turn up to make photographs, the first thing people say, where do you want me? What do you want? So you've got to kind of have a plan, but it's like you have a plan, but then you're utterly open to the mistake or something, the, the set falls down or the caterpillar or the, the wig falls off or the, the, and then that actually makes something beautiful. So, and I love that. Mm. I think I really have learned to um, really utterly embrace that um, chaotic aspect of, of the photograph mm. and the privilege of being able to turn the camera from here to here because something more interesting, unscripted and exciting is happening here. Yeah. And that's what makes the picture, and I think that's this, uh, uh, it, going back to this question, that's a balance, isn't it? Yes, it comes back to that idea. And, and, and you being open-minded to that, you know, and us mm. all, and, you know, Sarah might have spent 
hours on the phone begging to get a, a dress from Paris. And then in the end, I'm like, well, no, it's not about, it's about the T-shirt they've turned up in. Yeah, yeah. The white T-shirt. Heartbreaking, t -shirt. The but white we make t -shirt. it work. Yeah. <laughs> we were shooting a model, um, I mean, this must have been 2018, this beautiful model. And we were shooting her in sort of this prom dress. She had red hair, and it was kind of this amazing photo. But I think we both knew, like, some element was missing. And the prop stylist had brought a little round eyeball. And I remember Tim going over to the, the prop and put it in her mouth. And it transformed this picture. And it was like, and even when you look at it, you don't even notice it right away. And then when you notice it, it's sort of this amazing thing. I don't think there's any world we would have been planning that. I think that we had these props and I think that must have been for something else. And as soon as that happened, it was this amazing moment and those unexpected things. And, you know, I don't even think they're mistakes. They're just the things that happen on set are just what makes a picture yes. fantastic. And you just can't predict that, can you? No. Um, so we get that's a great story, the eyeball. I love We're going to move on now to talk in a little bit more detail um, about the extraordinary shoot that you've created especially for the Getty. So our exhibition's been touring all around the world for three years, but um, it was really exciting and wonderful that, that the Getty wanted to add a whole new project to the exhibition to make it extra special. Um, so you began your research into the collections and, and looked at lots of objects, but these are the two objects that really touched you. They are. Um, I mean, it's very hard, you know, when you're, you're looking around uh, medieval paintings to, to sculptures to contemporary art and to choose something. But um, it's, it's funny looking at this. I see this. I've got a, f a red fetish. It's back to that red <laughs> thing. Um, well, there you go. But um, yeah, I think these two paintings, particularly the, the one on the right, the Lucas Cranach painting, I'd always had um, a thing about the bodies in Cranach's paintings. And then we had a, a beautiful um, description from the curator about the, no one really knows what that painting is about, the Cranach, um, but we had a beautiful description by the curator here at the Getty on, on what he believed the painting to, to be telling the story. And then that kind of set me off on a, mm. um, an imagination of civilization versus the wild and the, the man on the rock, a kind of fawn, he's kind of got pointy ears. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, yeah. He, and he's kind of a wild man. Oh, he's called a fawn and he's kind of representative of possibly the dangers and the chaos of nature and the wild. And, and the mother of the two children represents civilization and she's walked down the rock from the, the town and the slain lion, the dangers. I don't know, there's just something about um, the excitement of going into the woods mm. that caught my imagination. And, and then the Annunciation, the Boots picture, um, it's just the fabric, I think, in that, the angel and looking at how it feels so 3D and the red fabric on the wall and the hand gestures, there's such a serenity to the, the dress and the, the fashion, the fashion, the clothes, whatever, on, on the left, and then the nudity on, on the right and what that means to me. Mm. I think it's the, the dressed and the undressed. Mm. Um, yeah, I think that, that really caught my imagination. And then the pictures, the photographs were, were an exploration into the two worlds how I imagined it and going into the woods in, in a studio in London. And particularly these images of the drapery, mm. straight away you see that yeah. connection to the painting. Yeah, and also the people, again, the sort of, the people that we cast. Oh, that these are great. You can see the woods, the interpretation of the woods and all the bodies in the woods and all the different bodies and a body that was painted in 1550 and what was perceived as beautiful in 1550 and then what we perceive as beautiful today and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who
who we are and, and how our tastes are reflected and what does that mean. It's such an interesting thing, I think. And I was fascinated to see how you created these, these kind of objects from the photographs. These little, almost they become like a miniature painting. To, yeah, this was it. done to the set. It's actually, I'm looking for a window. It looks like a plate, but actually I just got a piece of card and we cut a hole in it and then I held that in front of the camera. So it looks like a, a plate or a tapestry, but I was photographing through a window right up to the camera and then directing Salvia and Lewis through that. And then, and then I, re I remember when I was taking these photographs, it was very much a story that Salvia was a sort of princess and she was picking fruit mm -hmm. and she was trying to reach to get a, a peach or an apple. Mm. Anyways, yeah. I've always got a story in my head when I'm making a photograph for myself. Yes. That's a narrative that I follow. So I, even if everyone else has lost the plot, I, I've got a plot. <laughs> yes, you know the story. I know the story, yeah. yeah I think some, yeah. And quite early on in your process, if you're working uh, with a stylist like Sarah, you, you would share that story, that yeah, yeah, narrative. Yeah, we, we know. We always talk about the yeah. plot. Mm. Yeah, we talk about happening. the plot. Tim makes these amazing sketches that you were talking about earlier, or little notes. And then we start sending each other just things we see, mm. which makes it so much fun. And then sometimes, yeah, we sort of we have lost the plot and we don't know what we're doing. Then yeah. we have to take five minutes and Definitely. go off and start again. And <laughs> it's, yeah, it's sort of that's part of the struggle, isn't it? And the enjoyment of it, right? We were laughing earlier because when we did best performances in the first slide, you saw um, Tim was talking about sort of foam and these beautiful kind of sculptures foam could make and he was sending me these amazing pictures and then for whatever reason I googled foam party and then it came back like people on spring break in Cancun like getting drunk in these like foam spaces and then I was sending it to him and I was like wait 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 we've gone totally off course here and needed to get back on track. It's when when I talk to both of you about your, your work and your collaborations, of course, a lot of what you do is, is uh, in some senses, very commercial, you know, the, the, as you mentioned, you know, these are new collections of clothes, often not with the Getty shoot, but, but really it's about artistry for both of you. It's not about um, a commercial endeavour, I don't think, but both no, of you... No, not at all. I think that there's... I mean, you, it is, I think... As a photographer, when I look at some of the clothes that I've photographed, like looking at the exhibition here, uh, historically, it's, this, they are, it's, it's art, it's sculptural art. Mm. It it's transcends um, everyday fashion. It's, it's yeah, extraordinarily beautiful. Mm. It is like, as the Boots painting of the Annunciation, it's the same thing. It's like, if you look at, the, the, the fabric painted here in 1450, and then you look at clothes that Sarah has bought on, on set, it's the same mm. transcending thing. It just elevates people into otherworldly, extraordinary photogenic beings mm. that, yeah, is highly exciting for me. Yeah. I, I do love dress. I don't look at it as fashion, commercial, mm. selling. I look at it as a very much part of the set and the whole mise-en-scene of mm. the... It's really exciting. It's and it's a, it's a medium for you, I think, yeah, fashion, isn't it? I mean, is it? it's a, such a medium, you know. And there's a, a really nice question, actually, that um, we have from our, our virtual audience, um, which says, what was the driving force, Tim, um, that made you pursue photography um, in conveying your art rather than painting or sculpture or any other, any other medium you might have chosen, film perhaps? Um, why photography? I think... Um, God, oof, God, I don't know how to answer that. Um, I think photography, what I, I do, I, can, I see the, f the, the picture in my head, obviously, before I take it, and I can really visualize it, and I think I visualize it in, in a reality, 
as opposed to an abstract painterly way. And I just, I don't think I was ever good at painting, drawing. I mean, I, I was always interested in it, but I think that just naturally led and I found that I could articulate myself. It's literally just, I can pick something up and put it in front of you mm -hmm. and capture what I'm seeing in front of me. I think it's such, an, it's such a magical thing, a camera. It's just a box that will record. Well, like we all have iPhones and we all are taking pictures all the time. It's extraordinarily magical. Mm -hmm. It never ceases to amaze me that rather than me doing this and or sewing or, or embroidering or sculpting, I can literally just pick something up and put it in front of you and capture something emotional. Mm -hmm. I th yeah, I think it's that. And that's, I think, what people don't always realise looking at your pictures, that everything that you see in those photographs in the exhibition is really there. There's no trickery, there's no sort of digital manipulation, that what visitors see in those pictures is what you saw through mm. the camera. Um, it hasn't been painted on afterwards on the computer like so, so many other um, sort of image makers today. Um, and I'm not saying one way of working is better or worse, but I think it's very important that people understand that that world that they see in these incredibly elaborate um, worlds that you create, these visions that you produce, it's all really there. Mm. It's there in the room. What, what, why is it clothes for you? I've always been obsessed with fashion since as long as I can remember, and obsessed with magazines too. I like the idea of buying a magazine, looking at a picture, ripping it out, putting it on my wall. I think that clothes always inspired me and still do. And I think that the number one question I get asked as a magazine editor is, what are the new trends of the season? Which is so opposite of how my brain thinks. I always was interested in how clothes told stories. Um, and I think that's why I was drawn to your work. And I think that, um, there's something so amazing to be able to take an art that someone else makes and then create new art with it. Mm. Um, I think a really good you know, example is the first Balenciaga Couture collection I remember so well. Tim and I were texting each other simultaneously saying, look at these clothes, and then later ended up shooting the whole collection. But you saw these clothes and right away both of us thought, what? what can we say with these clothes? It was very fast. And I think that I like the historical element of clothes. I like looking at those clothes, thinking about Balenciaga, the actual man designing it, the new designer designing it. And I always like being able to interpret it in a different way. And I think a lot of fashion editors don't like working with celebrity because they don't always do exactly what you want, as we've spoken about quite a bit tonight. But I always liked that challenge and I liked being able to create characters with them. And I thought that was always a fun challenge to put the clothes that you visualized on these really famous actors and actresses. Yeah, and I love that word you just used, challenge. And we've got some other questions here, but we've, we've run out of time to answer them. But a lot of the questions are about kind of what motivates you and what you're doing next. And I think for both of you in your creative work, the next challenge always really excites you. You don't want to go where you've been before. You don't want to do the same thing again. It's always about a challenge, isn't it, for both of you? I think neither of us take on work that doesn't feel inspiring or exciting. Definitely not together at all. There's obviously commercial things both of us do that it's part of the job, but I think um, so exciting to think about what will we do next for the next best performances we do. Like those are the, you know, watching a movie, seeing an amazing performance, seeing a great fashion show, and then thinking about what can Tim and I do together with all those different elements is like, that's why I do what I do. It's so exciting to think yeah. about it. And, so, you know, I think I'll be sitting at a show and I'll see certain clothes that just makes me excited to get to do pictures mm. with Tim. I think I was at a Marc Jacobs show recently texting you saying, look at these. And I think that that's really exciting and something I do not have with anyone else just to say, okay, I have this idea. Or when Tim texts me and says, I really like this person, like let's figure out what to do with them. I get mm. very excited about that mm. as well. There's still, I can tell, listening to you speak, there's so much still to be done together for the two of you. There's so many more yeah. shoots yeah. in the future, and I think that's 
that's a really lovely place to leave our conversation. We could talk for hours, and I'm sure everyone would happily listen for hours. But thank you so much. It's been a, a real pleasure hearing from both of you about your collaborations and your work through the years. And thank you to all of you for joining us as well this evening. So uh, please join me in, in giving a round of applause to Tim and Sarah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great, and we can, we can head out and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.